it's uh, we're at seven o'clock here, folks. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, Shyam Joshi is going to be our speaker today, He's showing you a picture of Portland, Oregon Health Sciences. But he's gone out of his way to join us. He's at an investigator meeting in Frankfurt, Germany. Um, so I really appreciate going the extra effort to present from Europe. I guess it shows one of the advantages of Zoom, although most of us still like it to get like to get together in a conference room, and I look forward to doing that more frequently. This was going to be an in-person talk until his travel plans changed that. Um, a topic that has, to my knowledge, really expanded tremendously since a long time ago when I trained in this specialty, non-IgE-mediated drug allergies. So thank you very much. Let's go ahead. All right. Well, thank you for having me. And I do apologize. I was planning on driving up to Seattle for the talk, but it's a little bit hard to do from here. Um, yeah. So thank you all again for having me. And I look forward to having a good discussion on non-IgE-mediated drug allergies. Hopefully I can get through the whole topic pretty quickly. So we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. All right. Okay. Disclosures wise, nothing that's really pertinent for this talk. Um, we're not going to spend time on the objectives, but there are non IgE mediated drug allergies is a massive topic. And I could talk about each one of these specific objectives as for an entire hour long lecture. So I really wanted to highlight some important aspects of what we need to know as clinicians and what's coming down the pipeline a little bit, because I think five years from now, if I gave the same talk, it's going to look very different than it is today. And I think every year we're learning more and more and we're, create, we're developing new diagnostic tools that are really going to be helpful for not only treating or diagnosing non-IG media drug allergies, but really predicting who are going to have these issues, who are going to have these symptoms. So outline today, we're going to go through this one by one. Briefly, let's just talk about the epidemiology. And before we jump into that, there was a new drug allergy practice parameter that came out last year. Um, very important for everybody to take a quick look at. They broke it down very nicely into specific categories. Great reference guide for when you do see a patient with atypical symptoms or symptoms that you're like, I'm not sure what to do here. Um, it's a very usable document. Not all, all the practice parameters are usable, but this one is particularly helpful in, in quick referencing. All right. So, um, IgE-mediated allergies are, or non-IgE-mediated allergies are relatively common. If you look at, this was a study um, from the Partners Healthcare System, so that's the greater Boston area, and they looked at all their adverse drug reactions over kind of a 13-year period in the early 2000s, um, and they found that there was over 13.8% of people had some kind of adverse reaction, with 7.9% of, of them being immediate. Well, 7.8 is delayed. So about half the reactions are listed as delayed reactions. And when you break these down, this is kind of the what we're considering non-IgE mediated. The vast majority are cutaneous reactions. So 99% of them had some kind of cutaneous manifestation. Um, and, but scars, so the severe cutaneous adverse reactions, those are really going to be your SJS, TEN, um, your DRESS, and your AGEP. Those are your three big ones. And of all of those delayed reactions, only 0.2% of them really fell into one of these categories, which just shows that we're going to see these delayed hypersensitivity reactions pretty frequently, but it's very rarely something that we need to worry about. But there are those cases. And if you break those down even further, you see on the right side here on the table that very, very small percentage of each of these types of specific delayed type reactions. And when you this um, same paper, when you break it down into which antibiotics are causing the issues, um, sorry, there we go. Um, there are, the most common are gonna be your sulfon or sulfonamide uh, antibiotics are gonna be one of the big categories here, but penicillins also, so beta-lactams are still playing a huge role in these delayed hypersensitivity reactions, regardless of which hypersensitivity reaction you're looking at specifically. All right, 
Now we're going to move on to the MRGPRX2 receptor. And this is, I find this really fascinating. So these are immediate type reactions, but they're not considered IgE mediated. So when we look at our typical mast cell here, there are multiple receptors, multiple mediators that are being formed all the time. We're not going to go into each one of these. We're really going to highlight this one right here that's box the MRGPRX2. And that's the mass related GPCRX2 receptor, and that acronym is for short. So it's expressed predominantly in skin and fat tissue mast cells. And they are a functional receptor for endogenous ligands like defensins and antimicrobial peptides, but it's not really expressed highly in mast cells that are found in the gut or respiratory system, which does show that a lot of these reactions that activate the MRGPRX2 are going to be mainly cutaneous. And it's going to have, sometimes you get respiratory, sometimes you get GI, but it's really the cutaneous symptoms are going to be predominant. Um, and these can be activated by various different kinds of peptides um, and medications as well. So vancomycin flushing syndrome, this is where vancomycin binds, it binds to the MRGPRX2, activates mast cells that way, so it's not an IgE-mediated process. That's why when you see a lot of patients with vancomycin flushing syndrome, it, it happens very quickly. It doesn't have to go through the IgE pathway, FC epsilon R1, uh, and going, going down that way. It activates these MRGPRX2 receptor very quickly and can cause symptoms almost instantaneously. And then as soon as you stop it, it symptoms dissipate pretty quickly. Um, but there are some other medications that we're going to talk about in a second that also activate this receptor, including neuromuscular blocking agents, acataband, fluoroquinolones. Some reports of iodinated contrast may be using this receptor to activate mast cells, opiates, specifically morphine. And then there are some studies that have also shown that single nucleotide polymorphisms in this receptor specifically may predispose people for having these hypersensitivity reactions. So this makes it more prone to be activated through various drugs and things that we use. A lot more research needs to be done on identifying exactly which ones and how reactive people can be, but there's definitely a lot of promise there. So this was a this was really when it was first described in a clinical, clinical setting. This was back in 2015 by McNeil, and this was uh, published in Nature. And what they did is they created a mouse model with this MRGPRB2 receptor, which is very, it's an ortholog to the, M, the human MRGPRX2. Um, then they created knockout mice and regular wild type mice. And what they wanted to show was that, hey, if we activate these receptors through me medications that we typically use to activate them, are we gonna see a difference in mast cell degranulation? And they were using like super therapeutic doses, very high doses, much more than we would use in clinical practice. Um, but they did show that the knockout mice did not have any mast cell activation, as you can see on this table on the right. And th these are mainly using neuromuscular blocking agents. Um, they also did the same experiment with antibiotics and looking at fluoroquinolone specifically. And um, same thing, they, the knockout mice, they didn't have any mast cell activation versus those that had the receptor did have a certain degree of mast cell activation. Oh, that's a little bit off there. Um, looking at the human cell line. So this group, um, that is not shown up properly. Let's just go to this slide. Um, so this group out of Spain, they looked at, they took human mast cells and they were able to introduce a lentivirus to knock out or reduce the MRGPRX2 receptor expression in the mast cell line. Um, and then they still confirmed that the mast cells were viable. They looked at kit receptors were still there. FC epsilon R1 is still there and still functional. So the rest of the mast cell looked like it was, appearing, it was working properly, except that it had lower expression of MRGPRX2. And um, then they were given, again, these medications, specifically the ones highlighted here, uh, cystatricuria, morphine, vancomycin. And they again showed in the human cell line that 
you're going to have lower expression of or lower mast cell activation in those that are have reduced MRGPRX2 receptors. So there seems to be a correlation here. Being able to translate this to real world, still a little bit uh, a ways away. But they did find a few other follow-up studies that found some additional interesting concepts here. So in patients with chronic spontaneous urticaria, they do have an upregulation in MRGPRX2 in lesional skin, but not in non-lesional skin. Um, which is interesting in that a lot of times when patients have chronic urticaria, their allergy list looks like 20, 30 things long. And we, we typically think of, all right, they're probably just having chronic urticaria and people are misinterpreting that as allergies and they get mislabeled to having a million allergies. And that's probably true to a certain degree. But these patients also have increased MRGPRX2, which means that in these other medications like vancomycin, like fluoroquinolones, that they may actually be activating mast cells through that pathway, not just their, not just coincidentally having a flare of their chronic spontaneous urticaria. Um, and they've other studies have also shown an exaggerated skin reaction to a cataban atricurium, just like I was describing. Um, and TSLP enhances enhances MRGPRX2 degranulation. So we would think that an anti-TSLP may be helpful in this situation. So food for thought. Um, patients in, with uh, mastocytosis, MRGPRX2 expression uh, on mast cells are increased, which makes sense. Um, and it's hypothesized that MRGPRX2 increases risk of anaphylaxis to quinolones in patients with systemic mastocytosis with additional data really needed there. Um, this last point here is a really recent article that came out of the Brigham, uh, I think in Jackie in practice just a few months ago. Uh, and what they did was they looked at, uh, retrospectively looked at about 60,000 charts and looked at uh, how many people had a adverse drug reaction to a medication that's typically been associated with activating MRGPRX2. So fluoroquinolones, morphine, neuromuscular blocking agents, vancomycin. And they found that of those 60,000, 4,800 had a listed adverse drug reaction to one of those medications. Um, and so then they looked at were there specific characteristics of that population that increased their risk compared to those that did not have any adverse reaction. And they found that patients with mastocytosis had an odds ratio of 12.79, which is pretty significant, pretty big range there still, because I think the numbers were relatively small, but still a pretty good odds ratio that these patients are just much more likely to have reactivity to these medications that activate through the MRGPRX2 receptor. And so if you look at the number of articles discussing MRGPRX2, you see back in 2003, there's barely any, and really topped out around 2021, but just the in incredible increase in interest in this receptor has been fascinating. And I think that there's gonna be a lot of research trying to figure out how do we modulate this receptor in a way that patients that do frequently have activation of mast cells through this receptor, how do we attenuate that? How do we decrease that to the point where it's not as problematic? And so some people are looking at how the MRGPRX2 is regulated through the DOC2 mechanism. Um, this was an article I mentioned, what characteristics of patients have more activation through this receptor. Um, can we screen for specific molecules that are able to target MRGPRX2 and block it so patients don't have these side effects? Um, another way of looking at how to inhibit this receptor, another way of looking at how to inhibit this receptor. There's a lot of research going on right now. And so these patients that do have anaphylaxis to neuromuscular blocking agents, skin tests negative, very likely going through this um, MRGPRX2 receptor, could we give them a medication beforehand that prevents that? activation from happening and they can get anesthesia safely. Um, so a lot more to come on this in the next few years. All right, let's move on to HLA and delayed drug reactions. So again, there's been an increase in interest in how somebody's HLA kind of composition affects their chances of having a severe drug reaction. So thinking back to Middleton or Janeway or Abbas, um, there are many different ways that drugs can induce T-cell activation. We're not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but 
um, just briefly, like there's the Hapton concept where these drugs, small drugs, metabolites really have to bind to a uh, self protein, become large enough to be recognized by the immune system. Um, Angen presenting cells can pick them up, engulf them, and then present them. Um, this is the way that beta lactams typically develop um, sensitization. Then you have this pharmacologic interaction concept um, where really the drug antigen binds directly to the HLA or the T cell receptor in the absence of an antigen presenting cell um, in really a non covalent manner and causes activation. And you have this altered self peptide where it just really binds to the HLA or the TCR and changes the conformation of the receptors. So they end up binding to self protein. That's how a back of ear gets uh, sensitization occurs. But there's a lot of different ways that T cells can be activated. And knowing that, people have looked at different HLA um, relations to specific types of drug reactions. So the one that I feel like most of us have heard about or know about is the abacavir hypersensitivity syndrome, where it's associated with HLA B5701. Um, and it's recommended now that anybody started on this medication gets routinely screened for this allele. Um, before they start, because it has pretty good negative predictive value. But there are some other ones that are of interest, and I've actually tested patients for that we weren't sure they got multiple medications at the same time, um, and they had a dress-like picture, and we weren't sure exactly which one it is. Patch testing is meh at best. Um, so I've done HLA testing on these patients before, and have found people to have a3201 makes me much more suspicious of that vancomycin was the trigger. So these seven other medications they may have had around that same time may be opened up. And we actually did introduce a couple of antibiotics that were on the list of suspicion that they safely have been able to tolerate since then. Um, so it could be a more widely used diagnostic tool in the future. There's a huge gaps in knowledge with specific um, ancestry. And so as, as we learn more about that, hopefully just the numbers will become um, improved to the point where we feel more comfortable using these tests um, in general clinical practice. All right, let's move on to sulfonamide antibiotic allergy. And just wanna see how we're doing with time. I think we're doing okay. All right. So, Again, sulfonamide antibiotic allergies are frequent, one of the top two to three drug allergies listed in medical records, um, and it's about seven to eight percent of the general population. It's a big number of patients. Um, and there have been studies just like we have in penicillin that if people have this sulfa antibiotic um, on their allergy list, they do receive alternative antibiotics. Um, that's particularly problematic in HIV patients, patients with cancer, transplant patients, which is a huge issue because you know they're going to be transplanted. And if we can investigate these people ahead of time and remove the sulfonamide allergy, if it's not clinically relevant, then that could completely change their post-transplant care because they often need to be on PJP prophylaxis for extended periods of time. Um, and then our CF population as well. The vast majority of these reactions are really consistent with benign type four hypersensitivity reactions. So these macular papular, macular papular eruptions, not dress uh, or SJS, more severe things that we have to think about, but the vast majority of patients don't ever have those uh, types of reactions. And the big problem is that there's no good testing. Like skin testing has not been particularly helpful for delayed hypersensitivity reactions. People have looked at delayed intradermal readings, really not great um, specificity or sensitivity. Patch testing, same thing. In vitro specific Ig doesn't make sense for a lot of these because these are non-IgE mediated reactions. Um, and there's just a lack of studies to evaluate the long-term outcomes of having sulfonamide allergy labels like we have in penicillins, but people are becoming more and more interested in sulfonamide allergy just because a lot of people can tolerate sulfonamides again over time. So the big question that a lot of us deal with is, and I get questions from this from the hospital all the time is, hey, this person has a sulfonamide allergy, should we desensitize them? And so there've been a few studies that have looked at, okay, should we 
desensitize them, which I'm using in a very loose term here because we're probably not just, we're not really desensitizing them. We're really just slowly increasing the dose. Um, but with these delayed IgE mediated allergies, if their symptoms, if their reactions aren't going to happen for three or four days, why are we doing a three or four day desensitization? It just doesn't make sense. So slow dose escalation, that's what I'm going to call it from now on, versus a direct rechallenge. There have been three randomized trials. And in these, they've showed really similar success rates in patients undergoing this desensitization or dose escalation versus rechallenge. Okay, that sounds great. However, there's just one trial that kind of is an outlier. And this is Leong et al. And what they showed was in the patients that got dose escalated, and just still relatively small numbers, 100 in each group. In the group that had the slow dose escalation versus the direct challenge, um, over time, they were able to stay on the medication longer, even though initially, right immediately afterwards, the um, success rate in tolerating the sulfonamide antibiotic was the same. There's right around 92, 93%. But over time, those patients that had the direct challenge ended up discontinuing earlier. But if you look, dig into the paper a little bit more, the reason, by far the most common reasons for discontinuing were headaches and fevers, which are not two things we typically think of with hypersensitivity. Um, it can be, but not typically on their own. And so I don't think this is very convincing data saying that this dose escalation is any better than direct challenges. Um, and when you look at the more typical hypersensitivity symptoms like rashes and other cutaneous manifestations, there was no difference between the two. And none of the patients experienced any kind of severe uh, adverse reaction requiring hospitalization or any major intervention. So this, um, this trial took this a bit st a step further and was really looking at, okay, let's take our patients that are non-HIV patients and let's just challenge them and let's see how they do. And I think this is a pretty well thought of study. Again, they looked at 204 patients total, how many of them were not negative for HIV. Then they looked at, okay, we're gonna give it either a single dose or two doses. Their criteria for two doses was really just the patient had a more severe type reaction um, or was within the past five years. And so most of the patients were much longer than five years ago. And so they ended up challenging a lot of these patients with a single dose. And then they looked at, okay, they challenged them, they passed it. Then they, if they got treated for with a sulfa antibiotic later on, how well did they do? Um, and so about 23% of the patients that had a negative single dose got it again. And of those, only six of them, so 15%, had some kind of adverse reaction. Three had delayed, three had non-allergic, but the vast majority clearly were able to tolerate it. Um, and same for this two-dose group, very similar results that most patients were still able to tolerate it even after their re-exposure to it. So in general, it seems like even if you do have an adverse reaction, it's usually delayed, and it's usually not particularly severe. And so good overall. And if you look at the HIV population, nobody had any kind of adverse reaction with re-exposure, but those are very small numbers. And so what does the practice parameter say about this? I know this is a long paragraph, but it's pretty well worded. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but what they suggested was it's, you should do a single dose direct challenge for patients with a benign cutaneous reaction. So again, morbilliform drug reaction or even urticaria if it's happened greater than five years ago. If they had, again, a benign cutaneous reaction that happened less than five years ago, you should still challenge them, but you should do a two-step challenge instead of a one-step challenge. Um, and so I think they, the wording is very strong in the sense that we should be doing this a lot more. We've learned a lot from the penicillin kind of story that's happened over the past decade, but we should really be relating that over to sulfonamide allergies as well. And again, if you look for a sulfonamide allergy, you will find plenty and you'll have plenty of opportunities to do simple drug challenges, no skin testing, nothing else to, to really help these populations. Sure, I have, can I ask you a question? Please. That just has to do with terminology. So before this field expanded, we used to just call 
anaphylaxis, something that was IgE mediated and everything that wasn't was anaphylactoid. And also, should we use the word allergy just for IgE reactions and an adverse drug reaction for everything else? I'm just the terminology gets sloppy here. Yeah, I think people have gone away from anaphylactoid now. Um, and people are using non IgE mediated um, immediate type reactions as I know it's much longer, but it's stating kind of the that these are still you can still have immediate type reactions like I was talking about with MRG PRX2. Those can absolutely be anaphylaxis. Um, it's just not going through the IgE mechanism. So I think it's going to end up actually becoming a little bit cumbersome with describing the mechanism and the timing of it. But adverse drug reaction, I still think is going to end up including anaphylaxis in there as well. So I, I think that's going to be an all encompassing term, but that's not going to differentiate between anaphylaxis and a delayed T cell mediated reaction. So I think Ig mediated, non Ig mediated, immediate, delayed are all going to be descriptors used for these patients, unfortunately. Good, thanks. Mm -hmm. So at OHSU, how are we tackling this? So we have the opportunity to use this e-consult um, pathway. And I'm not sure, I'm sure UW has something similar. It's a little bit harder in the smaller um, EMRs, but for us, we have this e-consult option. And so what patients or what um, providers are able to do, and these are mainly done by primary care, but we definitely have um, groups of other patients that or other providers that also use this. And they can ask us a specific question. We've limited to this to just three topics because we don't want every single question under the sun because most of the time we can't answer that over an e-consult. But we have COVID vaccine reactions, we have penicillin allergy and sulfonamide antibiotic allergy. And so what they do is they put in, they click sulfonamide allergy. There's a list of about 10 questions that we ask them, which I'll show you on the next slide. And they send that in. That gets transferred over to one of the allergists. So Dr. Anstey and I may do most of these together. And we have the information we need there to be able to make the decision, hey, does this person need to come see us for a formal referral? Or can this person go straight, can, can we just take off the antibiotic allergy because there's enough history here that we feel comfortable with? Or do we need to bring them in to do a challenge, which is often hap what happens, or is the history very convincing for a scar for some kind of severe cutaneous reaction? And we just need to uh, continue to avoid it. Um, and so what this does is it bypasses that initial waiting period for the patient to see us. I'm not sure how bad it is at UW or any of the other um, private practice places, but for us to see a new patient for a routine appointment, it's six, eight months out. And a lot of these patients, this is a quick 10 minute appointment that we would be, we would love to see them for. So this takes us about five minutes to do, and we can get them directly in for testing for a challenge with one of our nursing staff um, with physician supervision, which is much easier to get in with than um, us directly. So this has been a great pathway for us to continue our outreach and our impact um, at our hospital system. And so this, these are the questions that pop up if you click sulfonamide antibiotic allergy. There's a different set that comes up for penicillin. There's a different set that comes, in for, comes up for the COVID vaccine. And what we're really just trying to dig at here is how long ago was it? What kind of symptoms did they have? Did they have mucous membrane involvement? Were there other symptoms that we should be aware of? But usually from this and a little bit of chart digging, we can get enough information for us to determine, oh, this was just a macular papular, papular eruption that happened 15 years ago. Um, let's go ahead and bring them in for a challenge. If there's any kind of uncertainty, we can message back to the provider or we can bring them in for a full appointment if needed. And so there are a few things that we specifically say where, hey, this is not appropriate for an e-consult. So oftentimes patients don't want to be tested. And so it's like, don't, don't send us an e-consult if they're, not, if they're gonna refuse the testing part of it. If that's the case, send us to a referral, we can talk with them specifically about the issue. But most of these patients are very open to it. They're like, I don't really think I have this, but nobody feels comfortable taking it off. And so this e-consult is a fantastic way for us to get high throughput of these uh, drug allergy evaluations. So this is very preliminary data from one of our um, 
one of our kind of pilot studies that we're looking at specifically for solid organ transplant patients. So again, that population often are going to need sulfonamide antibiotics after um, transplant. And so working with our uh, pharmacy team, so there's ID Pharmacy and specific call out for Amanda Baer, who did a lot of this work. She's one of our pharmacy residents. They are working with the transplant team. So when they're going in for their initial transplant evaluation, if they have a penicillin allergy or if they have a sulfonamide allergy, she helps direct putting these e-consults in immediately. So during that pre-evaluation um, process, we can get this all done. And we can get it done in parallel with everything else that, that the nephrology team is doing. And so, so far we've done about 36 of these successfully e-consults. Um, 14 of them have already come in, completed oral challenge without any issues. Um, one did have a delayed kind of headache fatigue, um, which she says that that's what she gets with sulfonamide antibiotics. Again, not a typical hypersensitivity kind of bucket, but it, it is an adverse drug reaction. Um, 21 of them have been evaluated through the e-consult process and are scheduled to be seen in clinic um, for a challenge in the very near future. And then some of them were excluded. So they, we got the e-consult done, but we couldn't get a hold of them afterwards to get the challenge or um, the patient just declined at that point because it was too far for them to come up at this time and wanted us to reach out again. So again, preliminary data, this is gonna be presented at ID week um, in the very near future. But I think, again, this is a great way to improve access to get allergists out there in the world more for people to understand that what we're bringing to the table is gonna make a big impact down the road. And our transplant teams are very excited about this. They're very happy because they have to deal with the consequences if they keep these allergies after transplant. So overall, they're very, they're very excited about this. And I think this is, a, again, an area that as allergists, we can continue to expand into. All right, let's spend the last few minutes here um, talking about adverse events to biologics. And then again, I think we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So there are over 190 biologic agents that are approved in the US now. And that number is it's hard to find, so it may be well over 200 at this point. Um, but we use these biologics all the time, and pretty much every field is having the ability to use biologics going forward, which is fantastic. Um, there's three kind of main categories of biologics here. There's monoclonal antibodies, which are the ones that we use very frequently. Um, cytokines like interferon alpha beta, IL-2, and then fusion proteins, which are slightly similar to the monoclonal antibodies, but the um, variable region of the antibody is really bound to a protein instead of the constant region. The problem with biologics are that they can cause a whole host of adverse reactions that are typical drugs that we, we generally use don't. Um, because they're directly affecting the immune system, there's different ways that it can end up causing adverse reactions. So there have been several kind of reclassification systems. So instead of type 1, type 2 kind of thing, there's alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. So alpha is really overstimulation from the biologic. So it, the biologic's doing its job, but kind of at an uncontrolled level, and you get a cytok cytokine release. Um, and that cytokine release can end up causing symptoms that are consistent with anaphylaxis, but it's not through mast cell degranulation exclusively or um, histamine tryptase kind of release. So very similar presentation, but due to cytokine release. Beta is our general hypersensitivity. So this includes both acute, so IgE-mediated and non-IgE-mediated acute reactions or acute infusion reactions, as well as delayed reactions. Then you have gamma, which is kind of like the medications either working too well, so like the immune deficiency that you get with rituximab. So rituximab knocks out the B cells and you get hypogammaglobulinemia. That's an adverse event because that's not what your intent was um, for them to be persistently hypogam. But it happens because you're directly affecting that part of the immune system. Um, you can also develop autoimmunity from certain biologics, such as uh, SLE. 
and you can actually develop even atopic dermatitis with these anti-TNF agents. And so this is causing an imbalance in the immune system, which can happen obviously if we're messing with the immune system. Then you have Delta, which is kind of cross-reactivity. The mechanism really isn't completely understood, but like cetuximab can actually end up causing acne. Um, and then you have the non-immunologic uh, side effects. So these are your kind of idiosyncratic reactions. You have neuropsychiatric side effects, confusion, depression. Um, and so creating this kind of outline is helpful for us as kind of an exercise to better understand what's going on because it may end up make, helping us decide what the treatment or what our recommendations are gonna be to these providers that have sent us these patients. So again, alpha and beta, so the cytokine release and hypersensitivity can both lead to symptoms that are consistent with anaphylaxis. Um, and there's certain risk factors that we know about. So the degree of humanization, so if it's a kind of a murine-based monoclonal antibody, much more likely to cause hypersensitivity reactions versus now these kind of newer generation ones are either humanized or fully human, those are much less likely to cause any kind of hypersensitivity. Um, there's certain excipients that are found in these formulations that have been associated with anaphylaxis. I'm not particularly concerned about that um, in most cases, but there are case reports of these happening um, and just kind of where the cell line was derived. Then there's this whole kind of category of alpha-gal and what monoclonal antibodies cross-react with that because they have these alpha-gal kind of moieties uh, present on the monoclonals. And so um, cetuximab has been known, kind of the classic one. Infliximab, which is again, much more commonly used, has also been associated with that. Luckily, we don't get a ton of alpha-gal up here in the Pacific Northwest. So not something I've seen here. I have seen it when I trained in Texas um, with some cross-reactivity but I'm sure in the Southeast, they see this much more frequently. And so even if we're looking at, and this is going back to Dr. Altman's question a little bit, is that, yes, we can have anaphylaxis, kind of your typical IgE mediated process on this first panel here, where you're getting IgE binding to the biologic, activating through the FC epsilon R1 receptor, um, yeah, receptor on mast cells and basophils and causing degranulation. But there are many other mechanisms at play here that can lead to anaphylaxis that are not IgE mediated. And so we have to appreciate that IgG antibodies can, in certain cases, cause anaphylaxis. And this is through the FC gamma R3 receptor, mainly on basophils. And what's important here is that because basophils are more predominantly um, activated in this type of anaphylaxis, you don't get that surge in histamine. You don't get that surge in tryptase. You actually get an increase in platelet activating factor, which in multiple studies have shown to be a more accurate representation of the severity of anaphylaxis than tryptase is. Um, and so as this gets, more, this gets better studied, this may be something that we're looking at with anaphylaxis that the ER doesn't even ever order a tryptase level for us when we want it. But now we're going to have to ask them to order a tryptase and the platelet activating factor at some point. Um, we'll see how that goes. Third type here is um, complement activation. So again, IgG or IgM can bind to these monoclonal antibodies and cause uh, complement activation. So specifically C3A, C3 or C5A, um, which can bind to receptors directly found on mast cells and can activate through the MRGPRX2. Um, which can lead to histamine tryptase degranulation. And then the last one over here is that alpha type, that cytokine release that can happen um, and cause anaphylaxis-like symptoms. So again, you can't rule out a biologic causing anaphylaxis just because their IgE is negative or their skin testing is negative. There are all these other mechanisms that can be predominant and we have to use our clinical judgments to be like, okay, this is true. We don't have the diagnostic tools to be able to diagnose a lot of these IgG mediated responses or being able to detect um, complement activation in a way that is really clinically helpful. But we have to be aware of these various mechanisms. Are these proposed mechanisms unique to monoclonal antibodies or are these no. more broadly to other categories of drugs? It can definitely be for other categories of drugs as well. Um, it's just the more recent research has been on the monoclonals is because there's more of an interest right there. 
but no, uh, like cytokine release can happen with certain medications, not all medications, but IgG, especially that B category here, IgG mediated anaphylaxis through um, basophils and PAF release, that can happen with really any medication. Is PAF uh, available in any laboratory? Is No. It's only research um, available right now. It's not available in any commercial lab that I'm aware of, um, last I checked. But it is, it's a very useful, accurate marker from what we've seen so far. So when we think of, again, the categoriz categorization, understanding which are alpha and which are beta does provide us some help in making our recommendations. So why that's important is that these alpha type re reactions are usually not immediate. So they happen an hour or two after the infusion starts or even after the infusion is done. Um, they most commonly occur with the first dose. And so we see this all the time with rituximab. You get the fatigue, the headache, the fever, flushing, arthralgias, vomiting. Um, so I can see how somebody looks at that and is like, oh, they had anaphylaxis. But if you look into it, kind of get the timing down properly, understand it's the first dose, um, they may or may not have required significant intervention. Um, you could probably make the diagnosis, oh, this is much more likely to be kind of a cytokine release issue. Um, and they generally do really well with slowing the infusion down for future doses. And over time, even if you keep the infusion the same, most of these patients can tolerate subsequent doses much better. Um, but you can pretreat these pretty well. Versus the kind of beta type where they happen pretty quickly, almost immediately during the infusion, early part of it, um, usually happens the second dose or later, unless it's associated with alpha-gal. Um, and they get much more of a typical pruritus, urticaria, angioedema, um, things that we think of with uh, our typical um, hypersensitivity reactions. And you could do skin testing and other, other diagnostic tools, but really when it comes down to it, it's clinical. And again, why that's important is that if it is IgE-mediated, or you're concerned that it is IgE-mediated, or even IgG-mediated, there isn't much you can do in terms of pretreatment that these patients are really gonna be able to tolerate. I have desensitized to biologics before. I don't feel super confident that it, it, it works particularly well, um, but you can do it. And versus an alpha, you're just gonna tell them, hey, pretreat them well enough and they'll be fine after a few infusions. All right, so the big take-home points here. So there are various forms of non-IgE-mediated allergies, both immediate and delayed type. So we can't just say immediate equals IgE, delayed equals non-IgE, that you can have non-IgE-immediate immediate, immediate, immediate uh, reactions. Um, MRGPRX2 is super important uh, cell receptor, uh, mast cell receptor that we're learning a lot more about and can explain a lot of these uh, adverse reactions we see with first dose Cipro reactions, but probably MRGPRX2, initial vancomycin flushing syndrome, probably through MRGPRX2 in the vast majority of cases. Um, full dose drug challenges with inpatients that have non severe immediate type reactions or benign MPEs, maculopapular eruptions in sulfonamide antibiotics is effective, efficient, safe. It's in the practice parameters now for the drug allergies. So you have a lot of um, oomph behind any kind of recommendations that you give there. And we do this very frequently. And I would say we're doing this not as frequently as penicillin tests and challenges, but close to it. We're doing a lot of sulfonamide um, drug challenges now and their patients do really well on those. Um, and then various Ig immediate, non Ig immediate reactions can occur with biologics. Skin testing may be helpful, but again, there's various ways that you can get these immediate type reactions that are not Ig mediated. So just understanding that skin testing isn't the end all and that there may be other mechanisms that we have to at least consider and, and be aware of. The word of the day is mystery. And I think I finished with plenty of time left um, to do questions about 15 minutes, perfect. Well, thanks, uh, that really excellent presentation, sort of updating what has been a mysterious field. Uh, this is sort of an old historical question, but the old formula for pretreating for radiocontrast with steroids and antihistamines 
Where does that stand? Is that yeah. useful? Is it useful more broadly? When you say pre-treat, what, what are you talking about pre-treating with? Yeah, so with the so the, with the anaphylaxis practice parameters that came out, I want to say two or three years ago now, they actually recommended not doing any of that pre-treating for radio contrast media at this point that the vast majority of those patients that had some kind of adverse symptom that we're using this pretreatment regimen for don't need it. And even if they did have symptoms that were concerning, there's no difference in the outcome in patients that we do the pretreatment for and we don't do the pretreatment for. So I think a lot of hospitals are still going to be doing that. And especially radiology departments are still going to be recommending that for a while, but the practice parameters have said just to stop doing it. Um, and so we have stopped doing it for the vast majority of patients. Some patients are really hesitant because that's what they've had for the last 20 years. They get some kind of pretreatment. So what I'm doing with them is I'm actually kind of tapering them down. So each time they need something, I'll give them a little bit less and a little bit less. So I won't do like those three doses. I'll go down to two doses, then go down to one dose, then maybe just an antihistamine before, and then slowly kind of show that they're fine and we can get them completely off at some point. Um, and there's also a lot of data on doing skin testing for radio contrast media now. And so I've been doing that a lot more too. And a lot of patients that have uh, skin testing positivity to one type of uh, radio contrast media are actually negative to other types. And so in those patients, we just switch which one they can do and they usually do just fine with the alternative method. And if you ask your hospital, they'll usually tell you they, they have like, usually two or three different types of contrast that they have available to them. And if you just get whatever is available and um, skin test to that, there's plenty of papers that say what the uh, best, uh, the non-irritating concentration is, and you can just use that to, to do this testing. Oh, well, we've got a big audience here. Other questions? Uh, this is Vinod here, one of the um, community allergists here in Seattle. Thank you for a wonderful review of these reactions. Um, you know, I would say with sulfur, given the, as you had alluded to in terms of challenge being the only way, two, I had maybe two parts. One was, you know, do you do any baseline, you know, labs like looking for baseline eosinophils or even LFTs um, as a protocol? Because, you know, you do get those reactions and you know once you've once you've been scarred once which you know i don't do much stuff i i you know challenges but there's one instance where i said all right this is like four years ago let's let's do it and uh, but for some reason and again i decided to do those baseline labs and you know and i actually did the skin testing and uh, and the first dose challenge was all fine but the next day you know, certainly had, uh, he didn't have eosinophilia, but he had quite often, you know, quite high transaminitis. And we monitored that and he got better. And he was certainly symptomatic too, along with that. And he got better, you know, after a week. So, um, so from that perspective, like once that's happened, you know, you can do, if you do one, if you get that, you know, which I didn't hear, at least in, in your case, studies or the reports having happened, you know, what would you recommend or what would you say? I mean, I know, you know, not just one case when it's car kind of affects you, you probably then kind of think about it more conservatively. Maybe that's not the right approach, but that is one thing I didn't hear about and, and wondered what your thoughts are. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's a fantastic question. Um, we do not typically screen um, just like we wouldn't for penicillin or for any of these other drug allergies that we're worried about. If somebody does come to us with a certain like medical history, like they're a transplant candidate or something, yeah, we want to see their kind of baseline labs just to see where they are and um, making sure we're not making anything worse. But in the end, I don't think there's going to be a situation that they're not clinically presenting with something that you're suspicious about, that you're going to be like, the lab is going to say one way or the other. It's going to tell me I, I should do it or I shouldn't do it. Um, and so none of the studies that, again, I referred to and none of the ones that have been done, Vanderbilt's done a lot of these studies for cell antibiotic allergy with uh, Elizabeth Phillips, and they don't screen at all um, for any of these patients ahead of time. And I think we've, we follow the same mantra. It's, yes, you're going to get those one-offs. And I think if you do this enough, you're going to get patients that have 
adverse symptoms, but that's just like what they say with surgeons. Like if you don't take it out enough appendix appendices, like you're not going to, you're, you're just not, you're going to get some that are normal. Um, and so I think we, you are going to get some and you have to be comfortable with that. And that's why nobody else wants to do this except us is we're okay with pe people having adverse drug reactions because that we can manage. And as long as you have that conversation with the patient that, Hey, this is important for you clinically long-term, but we're literally giving you something that's on your allergy list. And there may be some, there may be some adverse reactions associated with it, but if you walk them through that and they understand the risk, they're not mad at you. If they have an adverse reaction, they're like, Oh, I had an adverse reaction. I've had every one of those patients come back for follow-up for additional drug challenges even. Um, and so I think having that conversation is fine, but I don't think screening necessarily for every single patient that you're going to do a, a sulfa challenge on, especially if they're really low risk that is necessary. Thank, thank you. Maybe, yeah. I, maybe I had a follow-up question maybe for Len or, you know, the one in the audience, Matt, in terms of how much are you doing? Are we doing here in Seattle? Set you up or with the burden of the challenge? Uh, Vinod, the audio on that was too bad for me to understand what you said. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know if you can hear me. So um, I wondered how much uh, sulfa challenges uh, you or Matt, you know, Matt or other you know providers at UW, you know, is doing here in the community. I don't think I personally at this time have enough experience to comment on that. Maybe some other people do. Hi, this is Sana, one of the second year fellows. It's a pretty daily um, patient that we're seeing at the Montlake Clinic. That's right. It's very, very common uh, consult. We've been still doing mostly two-step challenges, but it's a matter of adjusting to the new uh, uh, parameter. Uh, this is Anya Lenk here. Uh, Sean, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, just a quick question. I, I don't think there is a necessary data on this, but do you think for the MRGPRX2 related reactions, uh, you know, like you said, that we think of those patients maybe are affected by those who have, you know, very long drug allergy lists. Would, do, for right now, do, is there any indication that kind of treating them kind of like CSU may be effective in a way? Like, you know, do we expect high dose antihistamines chronically or in a setting of treatment to be effective? I really don't see a reason why IgE, like Zolar would work, but I guess previously we would suspect maybe it would work. Any, any thoughts on this or have you come across any any papers yet? I know it's still early days. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any literature on that specifically. Um, there are, in like, things that we've known forever, like with vancomycin um, flushing syndrome, like you decrease the rate, you decrease the number of medications. So a lot of these perioperative issues that they're getting a neuromuscular blocking agent, they're getting maybe an antibiotic, they're getting multiple medications that all bind, that all can activate mast cells through this MRGPRX2. And so you may see reactions in that setting where you wouldn't see them if they got that medication on their own at a different time. Um, and so I think minimizing the number of medications that could potentially activate that uh, system mm -hmm. and general stuff, antihistamines, things like that, but there's not great data suggesting that they're, that's super effective compared to anything else. And so, no, I, and I know there's, I don't know any data on Zolaire or omalizumab with that. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm curious how effective you think you are in delabeling people with adverse drug reactions because what you find out is you do some procedure, whatever is available, show them they're not reactive and they walk out the door still saying I'm allergic to drug X. Yeah. So we have data on penicillin with that. Um, so when I was at UT Southwestern, I think the paper was published in Jackie in Practice 2021 and it looked at over 400 patients that were delabeled in the hospital. And of those, it was well over 94% that stayed delabeled um, over like the next year. And so some of them, yes, they, they weren't convinced, they weren't something. Um, there are some steps that we can do to help reduce that relabel rate. Um, and a few of those is like everybody that comes in for a penicillin allergy for us, they get this little wallet size card that says, I am no longer allergic to penicillin. So they keep it on them. They get reinforced that they're not allergic. 
and they can give it to their PCP and they can give it to their pharmacy. So everybody gets that updated information because we know that systems don't talk very well. Um, we're actually doing a study right now that's looking at our ability to delabel patients based off of just reviewing their chart. And so we found that because in Portland, us, Kaiser, Providence, Legacy all use Epic, we can actually see that they received a penicillin at a different hospital and tolerated it just fine. And they still have penicillin on their chart in, at OHSU. And so we're able to delabel those. And we have, I think, close to 200 patients that we've done that way just by finding documentation in the chart or the patient and the patients confirming that as well. We're not just going to base it off of patient information, but we want, to we want documentation to prove that they've actually taken it and been observed. And you can find tons of patients that way too. And so it, there's different ways to, to go about it. And I think a combination of all of these are going to be important. And just going back to Anya's point about the two-step challenge, on the outpatient setting, we still exclusively do two-step two -step challenges because that diagnostic code 95076, which you're used for challenges, oral challenges, it in the definition says it has to be a multi-step challenge. And so you can't bill that if you do a single dose challenge. And so we often do two-step challenges mainly because of making sure we're getting paid for, for the, for the work we're actually doing. Um, even though a single dose challenge is probably okay based off the practice parameter guidelines. Any other comments? What time is it over there in Germany? Dinner time? <laughs> it's almost five o'clock. So we are, we're going to go for dinner, I think in the next hour or so. All right. Well, again, thank you for making the extra effort to join us uh, from Germany. The broadcast, by the way, was perfect. It really shows when technology works. It's it's uh, it's amazing when it breaks down to pain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you can be sure I'm going to ask you to speak next year after this outstanding presentation, so you can start planning for that. Always anything for you, Dr. Altman, just uh, let me know. But thanks for everybody for taking some time this morning. I really appreciate it. And feel free to reach out. Um, just a, a quick plug, though, too. OHSU got approval for our fellowship. So we're going to be starting a fellowship in the next year. So if you start working with residents and stuff that are interested, um, let them know that we are going to be having some fellows mm -hmm. coming up. Well, congratulations. That's great to have another, another training place in the Northwest. Yeah, I'm very excited. Bye-bye. Right. Take care.